This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Hello, my goblins and ghouls. My name is Steven. The pick and place assembles boards. It has a vision pipeline that works and detects parts. The motherboard is just about done. As I say this, we're finalizing the tweaking on the last beta of Rev3 and we're just about to release it. And Lucia and I have been gearing up to start making a bunch of kits of this machine. Now in order to make kits for it, we also need to have made a lot of motherboards. So in this video, I'm gonna set up a production line of indexes to make motherboards for the index. True rep wrap functionality. It's making parts for itself with itself. So freaking cool. Now this is not quite as easy as just taking everything I bought for this revision that's sitting here on my desk and multiplying it by three and buying it all from Amazon. If we wanna make sure that when we buy parts for the machine, we know we're getting the exact same thing every time, they're all toleranced and specced out and we know exactly what we're getting, we can't just buy stuff willy-nilly wherever we find it. The way to make sure that we have a consistent source of a product is to actually work directly with a vendor. And this is what Lucian has pretty much been working on for the past month or so, trying to find vendors for all the parts in the machine, finding a good source of them, making sure that they're within spec and they can source enough of them for us and they're within our budget. And it has been a challenge. But Lucian's super good at this and this is what he's done at a lot of his previous jobs. He kicked butt doing it at Formlabs. So we're using this opportunity of making three indexes as a chance to validate all the parts we're getting in from potential vendors we want to work with. But we've also had to run a ton of prints in order to have enough parts to make three full machines. And so we ended up setting a little mini print farm up across the hallway. And here's the print farm room. <laughs> this room is originally where my studio was set up when I first moved to the house, but now it acts as a print farm. This is where I've been producing all the parts for three machines over the past few weeks. I have spent many a long hour in here trying to debug these Ender 3s down here. I originally bought them because I've heard so many good things about them online, about how reliable they are for printing, and with a few modifications, they put out really, really good quality parts. I have had nothing but bad luck with these so far. They actually worked pretty well at first, but after a while they started under extruding and skipping steps on the extrusion motor and even grinding through the filament with the extrusion motor. There are a lot of things you can do to try and fix this problem. I actually printed out an adapter to convert the Ender to a direct drive, which apparently does quite a bit and I have yet to actually do this and mount it on. I have some adapters coming in the mail that replace the fittings for the PTFE tubing. I've heard that helps quite a bit. And I've also heard that tensioning the idler for the filament extrusion motor helps a lot too, but it didn't work out too well for me. I just need these printers to be working right now and they're just not. <laughs> so I did a dumb thing and I took an extra long bolt for the tension on the idler wheel that pushes the filament up against the hobbed bolt. And I pushed it way too far, such to the point that it literally broke the arm that holds the idler against the gear. So yeah, after asking my patrons for advice, a lot of them recommended to me that I look at a Prusa Mini. The Prusa Mini is not too much more expensive than an Ender, but so far, it has been so, so reliable. I kick a print off to it and it comes out the exact same way every time, beautiful quality. It's really, really awesome. Over the past couple weeks, as I've been running this farm and printing out all the parts for this video, I've been realizing how important it is to just have a tool that works. When I bought my first 3D printer the sophomore year of college, it was a project. It was fun to work on. It was fun tuning it and playing around with it and seeing what optimizations work best. But at this point, I'm not looking to fiddle with a printer. I just want it to make the parts for me. I want it to be a tool and not a project. And the more time I spend trying to use them for a practical application and not a one-off prototype, but actually keeping them in production and using them for useful part creation, the more I'm really appreciating uptime being a consistent variable, part consistency being a consistent variable. So anyway, after a ton of printing, I have enough parts for three machines. Oh, this table looks so cool, check it out. And of course we have all the parts that Lucian has been sourcing over the past month. All right, so here's a whole bunch of stepper motors that we got as a sample from a vendor. These will act as both the X, Y, and Z motors. These steppers currently come with the wires actually already attached inside of the motor, but we're working with the vendor right now to actually get a connector so we can plug our own custom cable harnesses into them. We also got a whole bunch of the rotation stepper motors. These are the ones that actually mount on the head and rotate the nozzle so you can get the part in the right orientation. Lucian also got all of the hardware in the entire machine pre-bagged into kits. So this is all of the M5 35 millimeter screws that you need. This is all the M5 nuts that you need, all kitted out and labeled, along with just a whole bag full of limit switches, the classic MakerBot style limit switches. We just have dozens of them in here. 
all the GT2 timing belt pulleys and idlers, right angle brackets, plus some cameras as well. Lucian worked with a vendor to actually get them labeled as a top and bottom camera. And when you plug them into the computer, they enumerate as open PNP bottom camera. So you know which one is which when you plug it in, which is pretty sweet. And a lot of GT2 timing belt. <laughs> this thing is like a dinner plate. <laughs> These are stepper motor drivers. Each bag has four of them and we've got a lot. And of course, a bunch of pumps. These are the pumps we're validating from a vendor. So far they've worked super well and have really, really good vacuum, along with a sample of the blow-off valve that we'll be using for releasing all the pent up uh, vacuum inside the line so parts get released a little quicker. Linear rails for the Z axis. Got a whole bunch of those in there. All kinds of stuff. All right, I've got everything I need. Let's build some picking places. What has been like super freaking annoying about trying to source stuff, you're coming to these vendors with not a huge quantity. Has that been a huge pain in the butt? Yeah, so with the vendors we go to, like a lot of the times when you talk about buying a component from them, you talk about like a production plan or purchasing agreement. So like with a vendor, you might cut a PO that mm -hmm. covers a full year of production. Okay. That's pretty standard. Okay. At this weird mid scale level, um, it's not something they usually see or work with. They usually are approached by much more like um, established and like matured companies that sure. have like demand forecasted out in, like three years. For us, we're buying samples and then we say, hey, we're gonna buy more, we promise. I'll, I'll, I can give you an idea of how many more, but... But we don't know for sure. Yeah. So how, how do you mitigate that? Has, has that kept you from being able to work with vendors that maybe kind of won't talk to you unless you're willing to put up some of those bigger numbers? I've seen it go like two different ways so far. Okay. Sometimes it's fine and they don't care how many you're buying and you'll still see a price curve where it will go down even if you buy 10 pieces compared to one. Okay. Or even like a 50 cent part. Okay. Sometimes like, the vendor does not leave sample pricing territory unless you're buying like 500. When I get that kind of like feedback from them, I go, we're just starting out, this is a company launching out of the gate. Mm -hmm. We can't buy, we can't do this minimum order 500 piece with every vendor. Like it just doesn't, we can't do that. Yeah, yeah. We're building the ship as it flies in this initial like kickoff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how do you actually go about finding these vendors? Cause like when I did the glow tie thing, it took me forever to hunt one down. Like there's some weird parts in this that I've only been able to find like one or two quantities on Amazon or like yeah. some random websites that you have been able to find a place that we can buy like hundreds or thousands of them. How the heck do you even find these people? It's a lot of relationship building, um, like reaching out to people I've worked with in the past, seeing who they know, mm. who the companies they've worked with might be able to introduce me to. I have a lot of good luck with Alibaba. What I typically do is I'll find components um, that are what we're looking for, mm. but then I also just message a bunch of people. Mm. I cast a big net, okay, and I'll get, for like the nuts and bolts uh, we, we got in, mm. I had five different companies in like the first couple hours message me and I had candid conversations with all these vendors. I'll say a big tool that's been helping with that, given the fact that there's like an unignorable language barrier mm. between myself and them. Yeah. Um, like I will sometimes quickly get the vendors on to WeChat to talk to me because the translation tools there are phenomenal. Oh, WeChat has built-in translation. Yeah, and it's really good. Okay. So like conquering the language barrier is like a big reason we can be successful here. A lot of the times I find it's really helpful to be up late. It's like a show of camaraderie. Mm. Like, it's kind of rude to expect these vendors to like wake up at 7 a.m. to talk to you or to be online at 7 p.m. to talk to me. Yeah. Because they're offset by 12 or 13 hours. I take it upon myself to be available to them. Yeah. Like we're not necessarily the most important customer at these scales, so I want to be easy to communicate to sure. and like be there. So I would generally waking up at noon and being on receptive to online communication I'm like with these vendors until like 4 a.m. We were almost doing like follow the sun development. Where, like, <laughs> there was someone always awake in the house. Yeah, someone in this house 24 seven thinking about index for like <laughs> two or three weeks straight. Yeah, pretty much. That's wild. It was so fun. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoy it. Yeah, I'm a night owl anyway, so I don't really mind. Right. I made three. <laughs> and it kicked my butt. I was not expecting this to take as long as it did. I have built and rebuilt my bench prototype test index maybe a dozen, two dozen times. I thought it was gonna be pretty easy and straightforward to put three of these things together. It was not. Putting these three together took me a solid day and a half. 
and it was exhausting. <laughs> I definitely learned a ton about how the assembly process can be optimized, order of operations that makes things a ton easier, and eventually when I make a tutorial video describing how to put your index kit together, I'm gonna have a much better idea of what order of operation should happen so it's as painless as possible. And it honestly wasn't that bad, it just took more time than I expected. And after the third one, I definitely knew the order I should be doing things in in order to make them come together pretty well. I figured if all the parts are here and available and all sourced in front of me with all in a big bunch of bulk boxes, big bunch of bulk boxes, it'll be super easy to do it. And it does help to have all the parts available and right in front of you, but it's not the same thing as making assembly fast. Assembly still takes time. I definitely would not have been able to make all three of these using parts that I know that we would be able to scale up and use a lot of down the road. If it weren't for Lucian doing all of the work he's been doing, sourcing all of these parts. It was really good talking with him about what was weird about sourcing things at mid-scale. Because you can't do the prototype route of just Amazon purchasing. And you can't really do the full mass production thing of getting huge contracts with vendors. You kind of have to ride the line of getting samples from vendors. So if things do scale up, you can buy more of them. But you also have the reliability of knowing that you have a dimensional spec that you can ask for from the vendor. You know that it's going to be a good consistency source you can always buy more from and not have your Amazon seller run out of product. Yet another thing that's kind of weird when you try and make things at this mid-scale, sourcing's funky too. <laughs> but now that I have three of these things, I can use them for making motherboards. But that's for a later video. That's it for this one. I have a Patreon, so if you'd like to help support me and projects like this, there's a link in the description where you can become a patron. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. But before I go, I want to thank this video sponsor, PCBWay. I've been using PCBWay for all the boards in this project, including all of the beta revisions of the Rev3 motherboard that we've been spinning up. So far, we've spun two betas of the board, and being able to order the board and know that I'm going to have it in my hands within a week has been really helpful for trying to iterate really quickly and checking designs and making sure that they work before moving on to something else. If it took longer, it would just drag out the development process even longer and make it even more time before we're able to release this board. And of course, the boards always come out really, really beautiful. If you're looking for a board shop, I highly recommend PCBWay. Thank you so much to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Hello my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven. <laughs> no, I can't do that. Oh, yeah. Ugh, not quite. Almost got it.